Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. We are recording from Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. This morning is Sunday, December 31st, 2017, and we will begin our session with our morning prayer. This morning is Amanda. We can't, oh. we can't hear you, Amanda. Okay, I don't have my mute on. Am I, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. okay. This is Mrs. Eddy's prayer given at the Massachusetts Metaphysical College. Oh, my God, I offer as a consecrated gift upon thine altar a heart dedicated to thy service lips, speaking only words of charity, love, and truth, thoughts, striving to be only the true thoughts of the mind of God, help me to endure until the end, strong in the faith, powerful in the truth, all the influence that I can bring to bear, all the force of tongue or pen that is mine, I offer in thy service. May heaven help, consecrate, and accept. Thank you. Miscellaneous writing. We today in this classroom are enough to convert the world if we are of one mind, for then the whole world will feel the influence of this mind as when the earth was without form and mind spake and form appeared. So who will we have for next week to begin our round table? I read. Thank you, Florence. <clears throat> the subject today is Christian science, the golden text. Psalm 30, O oh my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. So Bruce, you can start today with your little bit about cry. I noticed that the concept of cry was in several places in the lesson. Here we had it in the golden text. Hezekiah cried unto the Lord. And even later in Revelation, we heard about the mighty angel who cried out. So I did a little dictionary research and found out that it had several meanings. Some of them applied here, but the basic essence of it, I thought, was that it was not half-hearted. It was whole-hearted. It was with all you had, with no reservation. I just got this picture of Isaiah who bared his soul, hid nothing, finally released it all, and cried unto him. Our God is a merciful God. He does answer righteous prayer. And do you imagine going to our God with all you have, with nothing held back from him? That's a pure request. Our God will answer and will hear. About the cry later on in Revelation where the angel cried out, not everybody could hear that cry. It took somebody special to hear it. The angel was making a very definite proclamation of something deep and profound that needed to be heard. Once he had a clear and ready ear for that angel was able to hear it. Who was that? That was John the Revelator. Thank you. That's a, a very important point in our prayers, in all that we do, that we are not half-hearted, not lukewarm. I will spew thee out, as Revelation says. You're neither hot nor cold, but that you pray with your whole heart, mind, and soul. The Bible says that, doesn't it? We don't seek him half-heartedly or timidly. If you do, you will get the results of that kind of seeking. It has to be a deep inner desire with your whole being 
throwing yourself on the mat, so to speak. And God does answer that prayer. Thank you, Bruce. And, and, and when you do cry, make sure they're not crocodile tears. In other words, it can't be a selfish cry. I want. Please give me what I want. Parents can always tell when their kids are pretend crying. <laughs> so God will know. God will know. God will know. Exactly right. God will know if your tears are pretend cries. That a cry to uh, you know wanting to understand him more, to know him more, to love him more. I feel that's a good wanting cry. Exactly. And yeah, that's the pure motive. Pure motive, not as you just said, not a selfish. <laughs> Why did this happen to me? And all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And believe me, I've done it. <laughs> so let's. You don't want to go there. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you're just having a, as I, as the South says, a pity party. And the pity party is, you know, self pity, adamant of error, all the self to get you nowhere fast. I think it also describes how to study and practice Christian science. As we talked about yesterday in the Bible study, those that dabble in it and really don't get anywhere, this is a final revelation of truth. And those who have a respect for how precious this is will treat it that way. Go at it with the whole heart. Go to study and practice Christian science. That's right. Thank you. Don't go to God crying to get off the hook but go with a sincere heart that you learn the lesson and understand what um, you need to do better. Yeah, when you're truly sorry um, and really repentant, those tears are good tears, and those tears, I believe, wash wash away a lot. They're cleansing tears. There's a reason why we were given the ability to cry. It's not a bad thing necessarily. They're very cleansing when you truly are sorry and repentant. Those are good tears. And they cleanse and wash away. Wash my sins away is the, the spiritual. Well, I'm thinking of the, uh, the golden text, Oh Lord my God, I cried unto thee and thou hast healed me. Yeah. Right. It's one of the many forms of crying from the deep depths of your being. Yes. And you know, later it says, "Well, oh, we'll, we'll wait till we get there." Um, <laughs> so much in this lesson, and fairly wrote it, and it's a beautiful one. In in responsive reading, that first, "Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help." whose hope is in the Lord his God. A few of you wrote about that, too. I guess it was Bruce and Shardy. you want to say anything, Bruce? Everybody's got their idea of what it takes to make them happy. How many of them have an honest recognition that true happiness, uh, man must harmonize with the principle of his being, divine love. That's a paraphrase of science and health. And that to be a really a fundamental basic truth. So, especially around this time of year where people do this and that, thinking it's going to make them happy. I want to reconsider. This is bringing me closer to God. Because it's the God of Jacob that is our help. It, it's a beautiful and so important thought. I, you know, often, and I used to suffer from this after the holidays. And maybe they were holidays and not holy days <laughs> at that time. I would be, I would get depressed the cold winter months. This is a simple little guide here. 
You can ask yourself if you're ever feeling depressed. Are you recognizing God as your helper? And is your hope and your trust in God? I can guarantee it's not if you're feeling depressed. It's not. You're not doing it. So get there and start doing it, and you'll find your joy returning. Shardy? Well, uh, it had been mentioned before, but how beautiful it is, how the lessons build on each other. So we have this from uh, Psalm, the hope and the promise, and telling exactly, it's not bringing us gold or fortune or uh, destroying anybody, it's saving us. Uh, the blind, the hungry. And then from last week's lesson in Luke, it says the same thing. And that just struck me. How, and, and when we pay, I'm paying attention for the first time, really, about the Bible. And, when, and, and what's done here brings it all to light. And it's quite a blessing for all. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? So well, I think for you know, for those who look for happiness in things or in relationships with people, it's good to ask if this were taken away from me, would I still be happy? If if the thing were taken away from me or if the relationship were taken away from you, would you still be happy? And if the answer is no, that's an honest answer. But it should spur you on to look for a source of happiness that nobody could ever take away from you. And it's your relationship with God that nobody could ever take away from you. And that's the only happiness that is eternal that is not kind of a, you know, a phony happiness or a fake happiness. So if you ever find yourself in a season of aloneness, that's the purpose of it. Now, if you fight that purpose and complain and say, rah, 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 I'm your friend, I, look at them, they're married and I'm not, rah, rah, rah. well, then you will continue to, rah, rah, rah. but, if you embrace the time and say, okay, Father, there are lessons for me to learn by being alone. I need to know more of your love. I need to feel you as my one and only friend. Then you will grow immeasurably, and you will have this joy that Jesus says that none can take from you. That's the only purpose of it. And once you learn that lesson, you'll probably find yourself surrounded with friends again. Doesn't Mrs. Eddy say this in Science and Health? Would, would life without personal friends seem a, what is it, a blank or a blank? A vacuum. Mm-hmm. A vacuum, mm-hmm. blank. She said, then this day will come. And she said, I've already experienced it, and it's brought great blessing. I think it's always the sense of being separated from God, which makes the, you know, more clarity that we are at one with God no matter what is so important because then we really do have everything already. You really do have everything already. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And that's and that is the state that we should be striving for. To see that we have everything. And that we're not dependent upon others or things. Our dependence is upon our Creator who made us and who gives us everything. And that way we can be grateful for the things that do bring us joy, knowing that they come from God and that no man can take them away. So when you think about it, as you go about today, wishing people a happy new year. You can wish them that they find God, the God of Jacob, as their help. 
and the God of Jacob as their hope. That's what we really want for everyone and all mankind, including ourselves. That's all that will bring happiness in this coming year. And the Lord opened at the eyes of the blind. While I'm thinking of it, Florence, you should write your last two testimonies or articles. That one, it was beautiful, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. What a beautiful hymn that was. Just to think that. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Beautiful thought. That's how we see correctly. And then the next, will the Lord preserve us a stranger, he relieveth a fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. And I thought what Parthens and others of you wrote was very good on that. I'll have Gary just read to you there. Oh, yeah, this forum. is Parthens Forum. Psalm 146, 9 makes for a practical, non-malpracticing watch for the world. The ways of the wicked are variously termed personal sense, animal magnetism, carnal mind, evil, devil, etc., and they are ever working to invert the ways of God. But to attempt to think thoughts of mind and thoughts of lowercase mortal mind together at the same time is an exercise in futility, like trying to paint a portrait of a world right side up and topsy-turvy at the same time. Quote, mortal mind needs to be set right. Right side up. I was cured when I learned my way in Christian science. End quote. From Science and Health, page 389. Thank you. And then he lists quite a few quotes from Science and Health, which... Uh, supports what he is saying. So any comments on that? It It is important. This is the right way of watching, isn't it? Well, I thought it was uh, telling that the, the, the Bible doesn't say the wicked he turns upside down. It says the ways of the wicked he turneth upside down. And I thought, well, why are they wicked in the first place? They're wicked because they see things incorrectly. That's the wickedness. And out of God's great love for all his children, his great love for the so-called wicked, how does he heal them? By turning their ways upside down. Because their ways start out upside down, and he's turning them right side up so that they can see things correctly. Thank you. They will be turned upside down. They will end up in destruction. All of that. It can't succeed. But that's not the real and the true. And, and as we've learned, this is all an awakening process. Everyone has the mind of Christ with a capital, the mind M capitalized. It's the mortal mind, personal sense of things that are getting turned upside down to be destroyed because they're not the truth about man. And I love in Science and Health, on page 200, Mrs. Eddy says, the great truth in the science of being that the real man was, is, and ever shall be perfect is incontrovertible. For if man is the image, reflection of God, he is neither inverted nor subverted, but upright and godlike. That's Adam and fallen man being (laughs) the truth about it. And what does the word inverted mean? Inside out. Yep, upside down, inside out. What about subverted? Undermined. Yes. To overthrow from the foundation, to ruin, 
the turn mind from the truth. Something to think about in your work, knowing that that cannot happen to anyone. He is neither inverted nor subverted, but upright and godlike. So if someone appears to have an inverted or subverted view of things, <laughs> that view needs to be inverted. It needs to be turned upside down so that it will be right side up. <laughs> <laughs> and and I thought, you know, your other testimony, Florence, spoke to that about understanding and freeing you from bondage and that right where the negative seems to be, for instance, you said right where the fear seems to be is the very presence and power of God. And it's good to remind yourself if you're feeling fearful. That helped me so much. That was such a profound testimony, and I've already had blessings from it, but I realized the negation couldn't negate unless there was something there to negate, and that's what really hit me. And finally, I kept seeing the negation as just kind of being a negative by itself, and I realized it's trying to negate something that's really up. That was back. Exactly. Thank you, Florence. Yes, it was beautiful. Yes. Thank you, Florence. Sardi, did you want to say? Well, I've been thinking about that. It's not held in something. And when we allow ourselves to be guided, then it's all, it all clears up. And Florence had said something before about it's our effort to see everything perfectly, that, that what is going on is already perfect. That was a long time ago. And then if we don't, do that, it becomes personal. Personal. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. You're very welcome. I learned from it. <laughs> I mean, for so long I was so in such bondage with fear, and I didn't realize that the fear was itself a suggestion. I never. I just thought it was real. I, I, you know, until thank God for. Christian science has practiced here that taught me uh, that, wait, you don't have to go along with this. It's the opposite that's real. Wonderful. All these different ways of saying things that set off light bulbs. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and Fairley's reading Wednesday about understanding. It all goes, it all flows, it follows, because... The understanding is what dispels these false beliefs that keep us in bondage. Once we see it, we're free. The light that shines <laughs> you know, reveals the dark and will drive away the darkness, as we said yesterday. Yes. Yes, and it was a wonderful Bible study. Thank you, Mike. And those who don't come to the Bible study, please do listen, because... They, they build. They're part of the round table. They really are. They get into the Bible deeply. Um, and it's important for your understanding. We, we touched on many things. Um, so now Psalm 103, which was interesting. Ray said that she memorized those first five verses. Bruce, you want to read them? Yeah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Thank you. And I, I was struck with forget not all his benefits, all of them. He, he, he forgiveth all thine iniquities. Do you think that there are any iniquities in you that he hasn't forgiven, that there's something it was just so awful that no one could forgive you for? And he healeth all your diseases. Do you have some disease or something that's going on you think it's unhealable or it's just not going to yield? Remember this. 
all. What does all mean? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing left out. <laughs> Everything. All. So get after those things that you think are whatever, unhealable, unforgivable, or things that you're not grateful for. All his benefits. And then Colleen wrote something beautiful. I think it was from, was it Matthew Henry? Do you, does anyone have it available to read? Or? Um, I, I could read it. Thank you, Colleen. Um, from Psalm 103, Thy youth is renewed like the eagle. And Matthew Henry writes, The eagle is long-lived, and as the naturalists say, when she is nearly 100 years old, cast all her feathers, as indeed she changes them in a great measure every year at molting time, and fresh ones come, so that she becomes young again. When God, by the graces and comforts of his spirit, recovers his people from their decays and fills them with new life and joy, which is to them an earnest of eternal life and joy, then they may be said to return to the days of their youth. And then from Job, there was another, um, let their flesh be renewed like a child. Let them re be restored as in the days of their youth. Thank you. This is what we know to be true. And it's important to, you know, because of the passing of another year, everybody <laughs> starts thinking that way, <laughs> excuse me, if you're not if you're not watchful. I, I've told many of the people that I work with to work with Mrs. Eddy's article on age. We have it on the website. Just a couple pages and Gary has it in the audio, but the first sentence says the added wisdom of age and experience is strength, not weakness, and we should ex understand this, expect it, and know that it is so than it would appear. It's a wonderful article, and it, it doesn't just deal with age, it deals with everything. It's very important to imbibe these truths. As we talked about yesterday, we eat up the little book and we become it. And the pages in Science and Health, 244 to 248 also, are the ones handling the beliefs of age. Not the truth, but we are, what? Taught, educated, the human to think it is true. So we have to, we have to turn it upside down. Thank you, thank you. Turn it upside down. So thank you, Colleen. Yes, I also uh, thought instead of worrying about age and tomorrow, God gives us beautiful thoughts moment by moment. And to feed off of that and think of that, it keeps us forever young. And there's so much good work and good things we can do with these beautiful thoughts. And there's no age to that. You know, it's continual. That's right. That's exactly right. And if you continue to do what God wants you to do, if you continue to be useful to him and to mankind, he's going to keep you around for a long, long time. It makes sense. So, we stay active in the truth. Now, a few of you commented on the story of the blind man being healed, um, blind Bartimaeus. Jeremy, you want to comment? Yeah, I just was thinking how interesting it was that uh, last week we had a story about a blind man being healed. And last week, Jesus had taken clay and mixed it with you know, he made the clay out of spittle and the dirt and put it on the man's eyes, and then the man had to wash it away, and then he received his sight. And, but this man, you know, just cried out to him and then asked to receive his sight, and he got it. I thought uh, that how interesting that was, how last week that man had to have his, that material sense cleared away, but this week he just was ready for it. I... And people were telling him, "Be quiet! Don't, don't, don't call out like that." 
I know, I thought that was interesting. And too, he didn't like, listen <laughs> to them, did he? No, he did not. He got louder. What do you think the difference is between the two? Well, sort of absolute faith, I think, an absolute faith that he had. Yeah, it was the difference in the thought of the two blind men. One needed to have the materialism washed away. The other one didn't. The other one was closer to being receptive to the truth that heals. Jesus knew their thought. Well, it was interesting, too, because it did say in this story that he cast away his garment and rose. So what does that mean? What does it mean, do you think, when he cast away his garment? Materiality. Yes. And he did it right away. He's willing to do it. His garment, a definition of garment is, it says, from the root of garnish, denoting that which is put on. So materiality, your beliefs, again, your beliefs, your old way of thinking. And, he, and what does it mean to rise? Yes. from a higher point. That's right. right. He rose up. He was ready to get up, and he didn't sit there. And, but he he was, as Jeremy's point, he was seemed to be very receptive. Well, he had heard of Jesus. He knew what Jesus had done, and he and he wanted what Jesus had to offer. Because when because when he heard that it was Jesus who was coming, that's when he started crying out. So he knew there was something there that I, he desperately needed. I did think it was interesting that people tried to shut him down, though. <laughs> but I was glad he didn't, didn't listen. And, you know, they have, haven't you had people try to shut you down? Yes, All the wrong thoughts come and, you know, don't do it. No, you don't have to call. No, you know, the mm-hmm. same thing. Yeah, you don't have to call a practitioner. Um, you don't need to come to church. You don't need to read the lesson. The Bible says, quench not the spirit. Kind of fascinating because in the other, the man born, born blind, Jesus gave him so much faith after the healing that he didn't even uh, equivocate or lie about what had happened, which would have been, from a material standpoint, a much better thing to do because he was cast out because he told the truth that Jesus had healed him. So it's just, again, those nuances on the different methods of healing and the receptivity at the point, but when all was said and done, they both... uh, to Christ consciousness of absolute truth. Yes. It, it was interesting once in class, and I will never forget this, it, it, this is Eddie talking about how love instantaneously healing, um, but there's a word in there, and the word is receiving or receptivity. That has to be there. All these people that want the instant healing. If your thought is super, super receptive, you will get it right away. You will. If it's not, if you've got a lot of Adam and Avera going on, maybe not right away. And he says, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. His faith, his trust, his receptivity made him whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed, and followed Jesus in the way. Okay? He was that receptive, and and that that Christ truth came. He received it, and he followed. He didn't go back to his materiality. He didn't go back and put on his old garment and sit down. He followed Jesus. He gave. He was willing to drop everything and follow Jesus. Did you want to say anything? Um, Linda, you wrote about that, too. You quoted from Judge Not. You know, to me, I just realized how universal the, the good and love was there. Ms. Zetti was talking about that in that article, where people would think she was thinking about them, but she just said her thought would go out to the world, and they were blessed if they were receptive. And I just 
saw the healing differently with Jesus. That it was he was he would have healed anyone, but you had to be receptive and recognize it. And this made me preach our, our watches more, realizing that it's just universal good going out. And I think it helps not to personalize the people in the church either, yeah. or your practitioner, <laughs> that it's just the universal good that goes out. Right. And that it's free for all. And you don't have to necessarily do something for it except open your thought and heart and follow God. Takes the personal sense out of it. Thank you. Well, I thought I'd uh, provide some contrast. Before um, Bartimaeus, he had been with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are very educated people, and it um, doesn't say, but presumes that they have eyes and they can see. So here it is uh, these highly educated people who, who could see. Um, but they were asking questions of Jesus to kind of trap him, you know. Um, and then later, you know, he goes by Bartimaeus, uh, someone who um, is a beggar, so maybe doesn't have the same education the Pharisees have and he can't see. But actually, he does see who Jesus is, anyone. Right. Very good. He has that. better sight than the Pharisees. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Carol, in Science and Health, the second paragraph on Citation 1, the decisions by the vote. By vote. The decisions by vote of church councils as to what should and should not be considered holy writ, the manifest mistakes in the ancient versions, the 30,000 different readings in the Old Testament, and the 300,000 in the New. These facts show how a mortal and material sense stole into the divine record with its own hue darkening to some extent the inspired pages. But mistakes could neither wholly obscure the divine science of the scriptures seen from Genesis to Revelation, mar the demonstration of Jesus, nor annul the healing by the prophets who foresaw that the stone which the builders rejected would become the head of the corner. Thank you. You know, I don't feel like I've ever read that before. Yeah. I mean, she's saying quite a bit here, and this is what we talk about while we have the Bible studies. It darkened all of their misinterpretation of things. But despite all that, it couldn't obscure the divine science. It could, couldn't obscure what she has given us. And in talking yesterday at the Bible study, we recognized Mrs. Eddy as whom? Woman in the Apocalypse. Yes. And our next liberator will be Mrs. Eddy's place as the woman in the Apocalypse. Now, we've had some discussions on this before um, in, the, in the article by Keeston called What Prospers Healing. He goes into it to quite a degree. And um, it is true in Science and Health, Mrs. Eddy herself, and Colleen was <laughs> pointing that out to me, and I'm grateful that Mrs. Eddy says, the woman in the apocalypse symbolizes generic man the spiritual idea of God. She illustrates the coincidence of God and man as the divine principle and divine idea. Now, first of all, what's generic mean? Universal. Yes. Is it? And it's the real. It's the, like the original. The original and true character. Now, in reading that, to me, that also definitely describes Mrs. Eddy, doesn't it? it? It can describe, I guess, all generic man, but the spiritual idea. She illustrates the coincidence of God and man as the divine principle and divine idea. Now, when Mrs. Eddy wrote this, why did she put it in these terms we were taught? Why didn't she say, I am the woman in the apocalypse? Why didn't she say? Because 
personalized. Yes. This attention to person comes with a price. And she was there at that time, and it, it would have crucified her more than it already did, right? Yes. She couldn't have possibly have said that. But if you stop and think about it, who demonstrated the coincidence of divine, divine principle in man as much as Mary Baker Eddy herself did in her lifetime? If we would honestly recognize what it is that she did during that time, It could only have been God. And we, in reading about in Bliss Nap and other sources, we come to understand that she knew at some point this would have to be recognized, who and what she she is and was, and not to personalize it, no, but just as we recognize who Christ Jesus is. And Mrs. Eddy made it very plain she wasn't Christ Jesus, but she holds a place in biblical prophecy. Now, I guess it was Carol who found this really excellent article by Clarence Chadwick, which will be in our next Liberator, but it says, our, preconce our preconceptions of truth will not help us gain an understanding of Christian science, but rather the reverse. Recent experience will serve to illustrate this point. A certain one remarked to us, I repeat over and over again the scientific statement of being, but I can't understand it. This was me as well. <laughs> anyway, it states, there is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material. He is spiritual. We replied to him, Do you accept this statement as God's word or simply as Mrs. Eddy's opinion? The answer was, I accept it as a statement by Mrs. Eddy. We replied, then, you have not accepted Christian science as the revealed truth, but almost unconsciously are clinging to the belief that you really had an understanding of truth before science and health was key to the scriptures was given to the world, and this is the very thought that admits a failure to understand the scientific statement of being. This thought can only see Mrs. Eddy as a good woman personally, rather than in her true light as the inspired author of science and health. Consequently, you fail to discern the new idea, not having made room for it to come in. Now, here we were taught that science and health is your autobiography. It is God speaking directly to you. If you see Mrs. Eddy as the woman in the apocalypse, you will understand this. And you won't just think it's some nice woman making some nice statements. It has a huge difference. Do you understand this? Yes. <laughs> oh, good, Florence. <laughs> now, now I'm and I have confidence that Florence does. I am, too. Now I'm going to have um, Tom read something very important. That okay. Um, I found this on the website for the Boston organization. Um, and it's about Mary Baker Eddy. It says Mary Baker Eddy, 1821-1910, was an influential American author, teacher, and religious leader, noted for her groundbreaking ideas about spirituality and health, which he named Christian science. That's terrible. Thank you. And that's what that's what that's what that came out of Boston. It's been referred to as a nineteenth century thinker too. Now let me paraphrase, we're not being hostile here. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are giving you some facts. 
okay, some information that will help help your understanding of science. And we have to put it out there because if we don't, who will? Nobody is. That came out from the BOD. It is atrocious. That just, you know, she's mixed up with any other religious leader. Now, now the Christian world would agree with that, and, and they would think that it's blasphemous to say the things I've just been saying, but that's all right. I have to say them anyway, because it's the truth. Someday they'll all understand it. Okay, now read the second part, please. Uh, first, did you want to say something about what we said before we started about uh, Mary Baker Eddy being an author? Sure. I mean, in the commonly accepted sense, people think about authors, well, they sit in their chair and think, have some reasoning and conclusions, and then they put it down on the book and they think they've composed something. Or maybe they've had some emotional dream and then they create some kind of nonfiction book out of it or something like that. Mary Baker Eddy did neither one of those. This receiving of the revelation was a divine event. It was not a human event. She got all of these reasoning and dreaming processes out completely because they belong to the human realm. But there is another realm that is superior, and that is the realm of angels where God's thoughts pass to man. They originate with God, the divine mind, and man is his image and likeness receives them. And that's what happened with science and health. And she she was the first and the last to tell you this. She said when someone said that she authored science and health, she blushed to even think that. She knew that God was the originer. She did not personalize it. But we must see it and see it clearly. We're the ones who personalize it. Yeah, and what did she refer to herself as? Scribe under orders. Scribe. She was a scribe under orders. She wrote down what God told her to write. I mean, if you look at science and health, really, who could possibly compose something like this? <laughs> exactly my thought. I mean, who could? You know, Benjamin said that in Nigeria the first time he read it. And he had been a Christian, deeply, you know, involved in Christianity. But he read that and said, no person could have written this book. He saw the holiness of it. And I'm, our point here is if you can and if others can, it's going to just blow the roof off of all the materiality and the bondage and everything else that holds man back. So it, it's got to be put out there. And it, this isn't in a way of criticism. It's a way of information, re-education. So, Tom, please. Okay. So this is a book by Bliss Stamp, Death Stamps and Mother Church, in the chapter on Prophecy, page 242. There may be some Christian scientists who have seen in Mary Baker Eddy only another religious leader, and it may be difficult for them to believe that Mark Baker's daughter could have a place in Bible prophecy. But that human estimate of her exposes one to the whisperings of desertion and disloyalty, which may explain why, according to Daniel's date, her title of leader is the last to be generally acknowledged. Thank you. You want to know how people get inverted and subverted? Turned upside down, caused to ruin. Well, that Tom just read it. it. Desertion. The same thing they did to Jesus. Oh. Isn't he the carpenter's son? Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. That's the personalization and the humanization of it. it it's what we do, not what she's ever done or the Christ. They knew it was impersonal. They knew it was it was God working in and through them. And the thing that I have heard by some of you who have been class taught and, and by some so-called teachers who have been very popular, that what they are teaching now is that she is not the woman in the apocalypse, that she is that the woman in the apocalypse is generic man. 
which is why I bring that That's topic very up. Important. Very important to understand this and to understand the history. Hi, this is Michael. Yes, Michael. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, I can I can verify that. That's actually what what I was taught, and it was I was not taught that long ago. So that is the uh, that is the the teaching the uh, BLD approved teaching in regards to Mrs. Eddie. Thank you, and, Mike. Uh, yeah, and just one more thing, real quick. Um, I in regards to how she's being described and what was just read, that very sort of safe, sort of Disney-esque. Disney-like description of Mrs. Eddy. Um, that's sort of the trend of what is being done by the by the BLD is this very um, watered down, very uh, mainstream appeal attempt to appeal to the mainstream type uh, description of her that seems very safe and very you know neatly packaged for mass consumption. And uh, just one thing about that is that um, when you try to appeal to everyone you end up appealing to no one. And if you see what's happening with uh, a lot of the branch churches, there is this falling away of interest and support and participation. And I think this is one major part of it, one major part of that issue and that problem. So, Thank you very much. You're and exactly right. And, that's, and it's been going on for decades. And again, this is not hostile. This is not criticism. This is who is telling of the foe in ambush. We can do no other. We have to do this. This is being, this is the height of being loving, not unloving. It is loving. It's unloving to let error go undetected and let people fall into ruin, get inverted and subverted because they don't know the real truth. I'll pacify it. Or pacify it. In the, in the uh, 1886 Science and Health, there's an index under Reverend Mary Baker Glover Eddy. The last citation is, compared to the woman in the Apocalypse, page 511 to 524, which is the entire chapter on the Apocalypse. So that's what uh, her official thoughts were. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'll have to have Thank you very that. much. <laughs> Thank you all who have contributed. And we're going to end now. Gary will read the definition of year from the Glossary in Science and Health by Mary Baker Eddy, our leader, and the woman in the apocalypse. Year, a solar measurement of time, mortality, space for repentance. Quote, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, end quote, Second Peter. One moment of divine consciousness or the spiritual understanding of life and love is a foretaste of eternity. This exalted view, obtained and retained when the science of being is understood, would bridge over with life discerned spiritually the interval of death, and man would be in the full consciousness of his immortality and eternal harmony where sin, sickness, and death are unknown. Time is a mortal thought, the divisor of which is the solar year. Eternity is God's measurement of soul-filled years. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for joining us today, and we will go forth and have a wonderful service and soul-filled years ahead of us. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.